Welcome! Today we're going to do wiggle wire texture parts. <laughs> I haven't actually done them for quite a while, so I don't have any of them here because they're all sold out. People apparently love them as much as I do, but I do have a couple of pictures of some of the ones I made in the past. As you know, I really do love textured parts, and there's many ways that you could do textures. I'm probably going to do even more videos about that. I got a good response on the last ones. Uh, I will put a link in the description to um, some of the most recent ones. But today, we're going to be focused on whistle wires. I hope you will follow me. What is wiggle wires and uh, how do you get them? <laughs> As you know, I like to make my own tools whenever possible. Not only is it fun to do the tools, it's of course a lot cheaper than buying commercial tools. Uh, your local pottery store probably have some sort of wiggle wires. Uh, there's a lot of different companies that are making them. But they're actually quite easy to make. Here is a couple of different ones. Uh, this one, very big wiggles. This one, a little bit smaller. And this one is uh, really, really small. This one is actually a commercial one I bought. I can't remember where I bought it. It's not that it was very expensive, but as I said, I like to make my own. And especially these ones with more heavy uh, textures can be nice. Uh, it can be difficult to, to purchase in shops. So the way that I make them, I mean, there are many ways you can make them, but an easy way to make them is to use... Um, oh, let me see if I can open this is to use um, these little springs. And I got this whole box <laughs> of springs for almost nothing. I picked it up in a, in a hardware store, and they're all different kinds of sizes. But basically, if you take um, something like this, this is a small spring. I have no idea what it's actually used for. <laughs> but then if you expand it ah, like that, maybe you need, sometimes you need to, to use a, a a tongue or you know, some, something to hold on to it, but I mean, I think you see the, the point here. And then in, in, in this case, with my other ones, I just wrapped it around a little piece of wood, just because it's not easy to hold on to. And um, that way, you can easily make lots of different variations of it. The more you stretch it, the smaller it will be. And of course, if you take um, something like this, it will be much uh, more, more dense. Uh, and then if you take well, something like this, uh, it will be wider and bigger. That's why I like to, to buy this, um, this box of, of springs. So um, instead of talking, let's just go and make some pots. You can use any kind of clay you want for uh, wiggle wire pots, but I like to use clay that doesn't have too much grok, or at least very small grok particles. So the surface is rather smooth. That makes the whole um, surface, the texture, more distinct. So I'm going to do it in this uh, clay, although it does actually have a lot of grok. It's a very fine particle, so the surface is uh, nice and smooth. It also has a lot of iron, uh, and it finds really, really beautiful dark red. So even when I don't put glazes, it looks good. But of course, with all the wiggling <laughs> and uh, the, the texture, I will glaze it. So, we're going to start out doing a simple cylinder, except, just like when we do the other textured things, I'm going to leave the wall, the wall rather thick, and actually very thick in this case, because we have to cut away quite a lot of it.
I'm going to scrape off um, as much of the slip as I can. I want a clean and a relatively dry surface. You could also uh, blow dry it a little bit, but I don't think I don't think that's uh, necessary in this case. So here we go. Um, I also want to cut out a little bit down here because we're going to clean that anyway. And this can go directly to re-wetching because that way when we cut it, we have um, yeah, somewhere to end it. I'll show you. So now we're ready to do the cut. So I'll go and pick the wet wire I want to use for this. For this particular pot, I think I'm going to go with this one because it's so convenient, it's not too white and it's easy to handle. Now I will move over here a little bit so you can see what I'm actually doing. What I'm doing is I, um, I cut away from top to bottom, but at the same time that I'm cutting, I'm going to move it like this. That way we're going to create um, uh, um, textures that have an angle and uh, then when you throw it, that angle is going to be enhanced even more and I, I sort of like the way that it looks. See? That's how it looks. And then basically it's just going to move to the next part. And you want to cut away enough to make deep textures, but of course, not so much that you cannot expand the pot or cut through it. <laughs> Worst case. It can be a little bit tricky um, to, um, to move the wire at the same time that you're trying to get it even <laughs> all the way down. But with a bit of practice, it's Definitely possible. And try not to touch the surface because you don't want to smudge it up. At least I don't want to smudge it up. I don't know what you want to do, but I think it looks better if you don't. And of course, all this clay you can just wedge up and uh, use again. You don't need to, um, to reclaim it. Also, try to, um, to cut almost equally deep on all sides, because if you don't, you're going to end up with, um, with an uneven uh, uh, thickness of your walls. It just, well, just makes it a little more difficult to throw. Now, what I found out, and I talked about this uh, in the architecture video, is that the drier it is on the inside, the more talk you'll create and the more you will, um, you will, you will turn the, 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 the patterns around. Now we already cheated a little bit <laughs> by cutting it uh, with an angle, but uh, I always try for these pots to do it as dry as possible, at least to begin with. Now it is more difficult to dry through <laughs> uh, because you do want, normally you want the, the, the clay to be wet um, because if it's wet, it's just easier. But one good trick is to use a very dry sponge because that way you still have a little bit of help without getting too, um, too wet. So now I'm slowly going to expand it. And this, I forgot to mention in the beginning, but I don't know, maybe the, the shape sort of reveals it, but I'm trying to make a um, bow out of this. And as always, the tricky part with this is that you can't touch it on the outside. I will be touching it a little bit at the top because I'm going to clean the, the patterns here. I don't want the very top to have um, any um, texture, at least very little texture. Yeah. 
some point I'm going to start using a whip. Um, it's a little easier um, than using your hand. Especially if you want to keep it on the dry side, which is what my goal is for this one. See, now we're getting to a point where the rim <laughs> is starting to crack up at certain places because it's getting too thin. And there's two solutions here. I could cut it off or I could um, just live with it. It's part of the design. In this case, I'm just going to show you. Um, if I cut it off, um, it's going to have sort of a fresh start. And this way, we, um, we have a little more room for expansion. It is tricky to deal <laughs> with these heavy textures because the clay is getting weakened and you never know when you're going to push through, <laughs> but in the end, I think it looks wonderful. So it's definitely worth it. And I'm trying to work as much as I can to smooth the inside because I like the contrast between this chromatic um, textured outside, but still have a very smooth and nice um, inside. In the same way as we talked about with the other textured pots, um, I like to throw them a little bit too thick. And then, um, because it's very difficult to predict when you can, um, how much you can expand it and when you're going to go through. But by making them a little bit too thick, um, you get a little more stability, a little more flexibility. And then in the end, if you think they're too heavy, you just trim them on the inside, of course. Yeah? See you. That's just my daughter. She's leaving for fitness. She's still fit. <laughs> I love this shape of um, of whip because it 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 kind of mimics exactly <laughs> how I like. Um, the, the, the bottom of my pot to be, or the inside of my pot to be. Um, so, I think we're getting there. It is a very dramatic pot. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. It's not for everyone, but um, I like it. The only thing I'm going to do now before I will let it dry, is just to um, to undercut a little bit, you could say, with my finger. But by doing that, I also create sort of a glaze catcher. Because the thing with these textured pots, and I know I mentioned it before, when you glaze it, glaze pots like this, even if it's a glaze that are normally not so runny, because it's going to pool in lower areas and glide off in higher areas, it tends to run a little bit more. So by, by pushing it up down here, um, you're going to get something of a glaze catcher. It's not going to catch everything, but if it's just a little bit runny, it will stop it from running into the foot and your shelf. So that's helpful. And we're going to cut, um, undercut it a little bit under that, because I'm going to do some sort of a foot anyway. So, I think I'm going to leave it here. It's uh, safer. I'll just smooth the, the rim a little bit. 
but I really don't want to make it completely even. I like for, for this sort of pot to have an uneven um, rim. It's a design issue, of course, but um, I think it works great for this sort of pot. So that was the first wiggle wire bowl. For the next one, I'm going to be using a little more clay. Let me just reposition. Yeah, a little more clay. Um, I'm going to try and make it a little bit higher. Maybe do something more like a vase. As you can probably see, I'm only, maybe who guess, I'm only going to cut um, down here and leave this because I'm going to throw a neck um, and I don't want the, the wiggle wire texture to be on that part. But other than that, it's basically the same as we did with the first one, with the bowl. Um, so I'm going to scrape as much as I can. Um, just to make sure we have an even and um, and sort of dry surface. And then I'm also going to undercut it a little bit. I found that it's easier um, because then you have something for the cut, uh, where the cut to end. Now we're ready to do the cut. I'm going to use the same wire and I'm basically going to use the same technique. So I'm going to cut and move. In this case, I don't <laughs> have the, the visual of the, of the size of the wall because I'm going to start uh, the cutting here. So I just have to go and guess. And also, when doing a vase, of course, I can't. Um, adjust it later on the inside by, by trimming it. Um, so I have to rely on my abilities to, um, to cut and expand to get the thickness I want. On the other hand, um, I'm not so concerned about the weight when it comes to a vase. It's going to be filled up with water anyway and flowers. So I don't care if it's not super light. Um, it's different for a bowl because you're typically going to pass around the bowl on, um, on a table. But with the vase, it just stands there. So it's okay if it's a little more heavy. Besides, anything with heavy textures will be more heavy. So live with that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can do the last one over here so you can see it better. Yeah. So, yeah, it still, it still feels okay. <laughs> It's important when you do this, um, I did a little bit too fast on the other one, but you want to expand slowly. You need to get the clay some time to, um, to follow you. If you're doing it too fast, um, it's going to get uneven and then um, the higher risk that you're going to break through. See already now it's getting a little bit bumpy. <laughs> That's how it is. But you see, it's already now 
even without expanding too much, it looks kind of nice. You see, it is swirling some, not too much, um, but we have some swirling in the in the texture that we we cut out, so it's okay. Now we're getting into this last part. I need to um, to add a little bit of water, so I'm gonna because the thinner it gets, the more risky it is, and then um, so I will be adding a little bit of water. Put this on my sponge and use it. And as always, when using a sponge on these textured um, pots, be careful not to drip on the outside because if you do, you're going to distort your beautiful textures. I really don't think I can add much more to this because I can feel now that it's getting very weak in the middle, which means that on the thinnest parts, it's um, it is thin as it can probably survive to be. Um, but I think this looks nice. Now I'm going to work on the neck. But with all this uh, texture and pushing things around, of course, it's completely uh, uneven. So now I'm just going to cut it off. It's also too big anyway. And I have plenty of clay here to work with. so. I don't need all that. So now I'm going to try and get the neck a little bit slimmer and then um, try and push it up after that. So it's always difficult to know when to stop, but I think I need to stop now. I think it have a nice uh, body and a nice top. I do think I want to trim this a little bit more, but it's just so weak now that I can't really touch it anymore. So I'll do the final, um, final touching of it <laughs> in the trimming stage. I just want to do the same thing I did with the other one. Push up the clay in the bottom a little bit to have a glaze catcher. And cut out it just a little bit here. So. That's it. And again, this is a <laughs> Very dramatic base, but it will look really beautiful once it's glazed. And um, well, if you like these um, dramatic textures, this is definitely one more way to do it. Now it has dried for about a day and it's uh, leather hard. And um, as always, I start trimming it on the bed because I want to start with the, with the top and then I will turn it around and uh, to the bottom.
One of the things I want to do is to make the separation between the texture and the smooth top a little more distinct. Yeah, I think this is, um, this is getting better. Oh, it's actually, <laughs> this is a good example of how well these bats uh, release um, the pots. I like the contrast between the very um, rough uh, uh, edges here with the, with the, with the, the um, texture and then a very smooth uh, top. So I'm going to smooth this um, as much as possible. Sometimes a shiny stone anything um, can um, can help push down um, any crock you have left in the surface and make it even even smoother but it needs to be pretty dry to do that but I think this is good I like that so now it's time to turn it around it's actually surprisingly uh, light um, which is not bad Some people will probably say you need to use a chuck for this. I don't think so when you have um, have enough surface um, to stand on, but I will be using a lot of clay to, um, to support this. Just be careful not to push it too much into the uh, pot because you could break the neck. But this should be good. So always I start marking up the, the rim. That way I can also check that it's completely centered. Because if it's not, this will not be the same size. Um, and of course that looks best. So now's the time to 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 support your your arms as much as possible. Don't let the don't let the clay take control. So now I have the outer uh, marked, and I will take the inside here. Yeah, it is a bit on the wet side at the bottom. It will probably be better if I wait just a little bit. I'm just going to take the, some of it now. Yeah. It's always tricky how much <laughs> you can take away. Um, at some point you're going to go through. If you never gone through, you haven't trimmed enough. <laughs> we all do that now and then, but you can tap it and you can hear the deeper the sound, the thinner it is. Right now it's a quite high pitched sound, so I assume that I still have some clay to go. And as usual, I'm not making it completely flat. I'm rounding a little bit to sort of mimic um, or continue the shape from, from the sides in, into the foot. I think that looks best. Even though it's a little bit on the wet side, I think I can finish it now. Because the problem is if I let this dry, uh, my support down here is also going to dry, and uh, that could kind of damage it when I have to remove. I'm going to round the corners a little bit. The reason I round the corners is that I do love very sharp corners, but they're very fragile. If you round them off a little bit, they're less likely to chip off when you bump into something. So they stay beautiful longer if you do that. Now I just need to add my maker's mark. I'm going to put it on the rim here because, or the foot, because I'm not going to glaze it there. Probably going to add some wash, but now I have my maker's mark there, and I think that's beautiful. Now I just have to release the the lower part. I just bend it down a little bit. Um, and now that I put so much on, <laughs> I have to be a little bit careful. I think that goes well. Um, there we go. 
that's a vase. And it's actually not that heavy. Kind of surprising. Now, if you have all these little pieces on, on the textured part, I, I wouldn't remove that now, because if you try to remove it, you're just going to smudge it in. Let it dry, because these little pieces will be very easy to, to scratch off, if you want to, um, before you basically dry them. So, I'm going to leave that for the final drying. The second part here is a little more tricky, because it's a bowl, and um, it's even more dramatic on the outside, and um, I want to make sure that it's not too thick, uh, too heavy, because it is a bowl, so it's probably going to move it around on the table or something. And as I mentioned several times before, when I do heavy textures, I always throw it too thick, because that way you have a more stable wall when you do the texturing, and, uh, and also there's less risk that you're going to break through during the throwing. But now that we're done with the throwing and it's sort of a little hard, I can now uh, check if, um, if I can remove some clay. And I can, not so much up here, but down here uh, it's a little bit thick. So I should be able to remove some of that. Um, even though this one actually have a very smooth inside, I'm going to, um, to try and keep that, but uh, still removing some of the clay. I know, <laughs> I said it before, but some potters tell you never to trim the inside of a bowl. But I'm like, why not? Um, it works really well. One of the tricky parts, of course, is that um, all the scraps are not going to fall off, they fall into the pot. have to be very careful, remove a little bit, um, but don't try and scrape it out because then, again, you're going to smudge it into the pot. You're just going to take out the big parts and then um, if you need to get the rest out, you can you can blow dry it because the little piece is going to dry really fast, and then you can pour them out. See now this one also released itself. <laughs> they they do that on these beds. I probably need to um, take it off the the bed and secure it um, with a couple of lumps of clay, which is fine. See, it's actually quite a lot that I'm removing, and now you can you can sort of feel. The problem here is, of course, that on the high parts of the texture, it's going to be thick. There's nothing to do about that. You have to aim for like this, the thinnest parts of it, because that's the, where the limit is. You can't, of course, get much thinner than a couple of millimeters or something. And within this process, you also need to. Um, Make sure that you preserve um, the the curve inside that you want. Um, now you can see I'm getting uh, trimming uh, lines in here. Uh, for this particular bowl, I actually and the glazing, I'm thinking of um, uh, maybe this uh, folk art white gilt. Um, I like to keep these lines because it will break beautiful. Um, I'm just going to make sure that they're not too high. I don't want them to be so high or deep that they can harbor bacteria and be unsafe for food. But um, I do want to keep the, the lines. As I said, it's not going to be a super light bowl with this heavy texture, but I think, I think we're getting, getting there. See, it's a lot that we have been moving now. And um, yeah, I think some of the weakest points, it's actually quite, <laughs> quite thin now. Um, so I think, I think I'm going to leave it with that for now. And then um, I will dry it a little bit to get rid of this, um, these last pieces of uh, scrap in the bottom. Now, as you see, or at least when I remove this, um, yeah, it's a little bit stuck here. Yeah, 
as you see, all these little pieces um, are drying off and, um, and therefore makes it much easier to, um, to brush them out like this. Just be careful you don't accidentally push down any of the still uh, dry, uh, still wet um, pieces into the bowl. Just going to get rid of more of it than um, what I had before. Like this. And now we can finish the inside. I'm just basically making sure that we still have that continuous and smooth um, curve. Of course, with some of these trimming lines left, but nevertheless, a, a nice smooth curve. So I think, I think that's it, maybe a little bit here. I'm not too worried about these little pieces of, of scrap left here because it's going to dry off and will be very easy to remove. So, I think that's it for the inside. I just need to turn it around. As always, make sure that your surface here is clean so you don't mess up your 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 rim And as you see, I'm not going out and in, I'm going up and down. And that way I secure that even if it's not completely centered, I will get a, a circle that is um, And you see now that I'm um, cutting away some of it here. I'm even going to make this um, glaze catcher, as I call it, uh, even more distinct. So when the glaze here floats down, it's going to get stuck by this and it, it probably <laughs> won't um, run as much into, um, into my foot and into um, up to the shelves. So now we're ready for the, for the foot. Now, you see, it's very nice. Can you hear how deep this is? <laughs> so, I don't have so much to go there. I can take a little more on the edges, but not so much in the middle. Mark, and again, I know I mentioned this before, but these ones are amazing. I had them made by a woman in Ukraine, and I think you can still buy them from her. They're not so expensive, and they're super good. Very thin, very sharp, very deep, and it's made in stainless steel, so they last almost forever. There we go. Now we have it. A finished bowl. And it is actually, I mean, it is a little more heavy than I would usually make if I didn't have all the textures. But with the textures and all, I think it's actually pretty good. Now the pots have dried and are ready to bisque fire. And how do I know that they're ready? Well, there's a really good trick to that. 
Um, if you feel your pot, if it's uh, if it feels normal, warm, <laughs> uh, then it should be dried. If there's any areas when you take your hand down, typically in the top, they dry fastest. And then if you take your hand down, if it feels cold at some places, that's because they're still moist inside. And then you don't want to fire it. At least there's a higher risk of ex exploding in your kiln. So um, try and feel the pot, uh, also the thick places. If it feels warm, if it doesn't feel cold, then it should be ready to fire. I'm really looking forward um, to finish these pots because next step, of course, is to glaze them. And with textured pots, there's a lot of great options um, in, um, in how to glaze them so you highlight all these textures. And of course, we want to do that because now we made these beautiful textures and we want them to shine even more uh, with the glaze. There are also a bit of challenges. I also already talked a little bit about it um, during the, the throwing of these. But if you, um, if you have heavy textures, the glaze is going to pool in the deep areas. And that will make at least some glazes run a little bit more. So that's why I made these ones with, um, with this, uh, I call it a glazed catcher, but this area down here that, that will help prevent the glaze from uh, running down uh, on the foot and onto your shelves <laughs> and glue it to your shelves. I have made a number of different textures over the past few videos and I will try and get as many of them glazed in the next video or the coming videos and uh, show you how I do that and then look at the final results. I will have a new video coming up next Sunday. As usual, I try to premiere a new detailed video like this uh, every Sunday at 5 um, p.m. Central European time. So uh, please come back and see that. If you like this video, uh, please subscribe to be notified about new videos and um, comment, share, whatever. All comments are welcome. As long as you keep a good tone, everything is welcome. Good comments, good suggestions, very welcome. Even if you don't like what I did, that's welcome too. So I hope to see you soon again. Have a great day.